Hello and welcome to eCancer TV. It's the 2018 ASCO. Uh, my name is Neil Shore. I'm the medical director of Carolina Urologic Research Center in South Carolina. Uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to have uh, three wonderful colleagues here today uh, uh, to go over some really cutting edge aspects of the uh, abstracts that are being presented. Uh, immediately to my left is uh, Simon Chowdhury from uh, London, England. And then we have Matthew Smith uh, from uh, Boston, the US, and Boris Hadeshek from Essen, Germany. So uh, I apologize to my medical oncology colleagues. You're bookended by <laughs> urologists. There, there's something you know, not right about that at ASCO. But in, in a way, I think it is true. I mean, we're, we're really trying to develop more integrative care globally and multidisciplinary care. And so we're going to talk today about some of the advances and really interesting abstracts in advanced prostate cancer. So I'll, I'll start with, with you, Simon. Um, maybe you'd like to comment on this paper by uh, Joaquin Mateo, uh, who you've worked with extensively, on genomic profiling of prostate tumors from patients who develop metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, a, a field that has really just kind of exploded in, in so many different ways. And maybe you want to comment on that. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I think a really important abstract, um, one from the Institute of Cancer Research, not far from where I work in London. And what they looked at was, was clinically significant prostate cancer, so primary cancers that have become metastatic castrate refractory. And they had 470 primary samples from the original patients, which they profiled, and then they had 48 samples from other patients from, from that group who had developed metastatic disease, so paired metastatic castrate refractory biopsies. I think the take-home message really was that what was very interesting was there was a high frequency of, of DNA damage repair deficiency, which we're sort of starting to see and has relevance in terms of some of the new drugs emerging, particularly the PARP inhibitor studies that are taking place. Uh, and they saw uh, about 20% of the uh, abnormality there, 5% BRCA, 4% ATM, so some really relevant gene abnormalities. What was interesting was looking at the, the patients who had the subsequent biopsies that have evolved over time and under selection pressure with treatment, that those abnormalities seem to be persistent. They haven't changed those particular DNA damage repair ones. So it seems as if we can use the primaries to then, to then drive treatment later. Uh, I think we should be doing rebiopsies, but it was, I thought it was very, very promising and provides a sort of approach for, for some element of moving away from treatments for everyone. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, uh, thoughts on you know, somatic mutations as opposed to germline mutations and, and advice for our colleagues? I think it's reassuring that for men that are at very high risk in the beginning of the disease, we might be able to predict who to take extra care of yeah, and who to maybe watch more closely. So I was happy to see that abstract as well because it seems to allow us to focus on a very high risk group just from the start where we as urologists take care of the patients and, and uh, this might be an opportunity for future clinical trials in that setting. Yeah. And the implications of, of therapies uh, along the, con the disease continuum, not to mention the potential for downstream implications for family members. Mm. Um, so, Matthew, let me ask you, um, um, given your um, leadership in, in the Spartan trial, and congratulations on, on a, a wonderful global phase three trial, your New England Journal article and your presentations, um, uh, here at ASCO, you're reviewing um, the, the association, uh, and, and it's an endpoint that has met a regulatory approval, and it's a new endpoint for many of our colleagues to understand that that's metastasis-free survival. Uh, and you're, you have an abstract here on the association of MFS and OS uh, in non-metastatic CRPC patients. Um, Tell us about that. Sure, absolutely. So Spartan is a global randomized controlled trial that supported the approval of apalutamide in non-metastatic CRPC. And it was precedent setting and it's the first approval in oncology based on metastasis-free survival. Um, there is evidence from that trial um, of post-progression benefit. There's a delay in symptomatic progression, for example. But as you'd imagine, survival is going to be a later outcome, and at the time of the primary analysis, we don't have mature survival data. So while we await that information, we decided to have a, a critical look at the relationship between MFS and, and overall survival, and we did that with landmark analyses and found a strong correlation between MFS and overall survival, depending on which method of analysis, correlation coefficients of 0.63 to 0.69, suggesting that we explain yeah. about half of the variability of survival 
with metastasis free survival. So that's what can be considered quite robust and, and provides further support for it as a valid intermediate endpoint. Mm -hmm. Great. Bar, Simon, any thoughts on the, these, this really landmark study? Uh, the first now approved uh, agent of any type in this disease category of NMCRPC or what some have called M0 CRPC, uh, and now we have an approved uh, uh, therapeutic? Yeah, no, I think it's a really important study. I mean, one, one I was involved with to a small degree, and Matthew sh should be applauded for having designed it right from the start. I think also this metastasis free survival is something that is going to be really important, not only for this drug, but for other drugs going forward. And I think it's, it's great that, that Matthew's done this work that, that shows the robustness of the data and that it is a good surrogate for overall survival. I think it'll be important going forward for, for several drugs. I think you're absolutely right, and even potentially earlier disease states, Absolutely. perhaps even in the biochemical relapse um, uh, disease population, some yeah. of the, the trials that are entering in, in, in almost a com on completion. So um, let me uh, ask you, Boris. Um, uh, I, I think that you know we we talked about you know the uh, the this really interesting trial. Uh, it's a phase two study. The first author is is Calif, uh, and they looked at uh, a crossover trial design of of ab abby and prednisone versus enzalutamide and came up with some, their recommendations in the, a, a second-line therapy. Uh, and there's always been a fair amount of recent controversy in small single institution, ret mostly retrospective uh, uh, sequencing studies. What are some of the findings in this trial? So I think many of us have waited for the poster that now describes the yeah, more mature results of that sequencing study from Vancouver because the uh, first part of the study was presented last year, and it showed us that uh, Abi maybe had uh, little less side effects towards the patient than ENSA. Um, and what we are seeing now is that um, from a perspective of um, response to second-line therapy, the sequence of Abi followed by ENSA might be beneficial. So you see more responses if you follow with ENSA post Abi. However, what is more important to me and what was um, yeah, made me feel reassured with regards to current cl clinical practice is that now on the poster they also present overall data where they show how is progression-free survival too. So from the time of the start of the first therapy to progression during the second therapy are there differences depending on with which drug the patient was started. And uh, there were no clinically significant differences in this 200 patient trial. So um, in the end, I think it's uh, up to the individual discussion with the patient with which drug you want to start. The big difference is not there if you consider just the, the two drugs, whether we should have some other partners in between, considering chemotherapy and all this um, is something other important. But when you just look at Abi and ENSA, the sequence uh, does not seem that important, but certainly we're waiting now about the combination studies. And um, I think it's, it's an exciting field. Yeah? And uh, in this study, it was important to see that when you look at the overall patient, there was no difference in the overall survival. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I applaud them for doing that study. I, I still think, though, and I, I'm curious, gentlemen, your thoughts on this notion of the novel hormonal uh, uh, agents and sequencing when we see progression, whether it's more than just PSA progression or PSA elevation, but there's new radiographic findings and or clinical progression. Uh, any quick comments regarding the use of taxane therapy or radiopharmaceutical? Let's leave clinical trials out of it because that's always a, a, a nice way to go and a good way to go. But thoughts, Simon, first, and then Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I think that very much reflects my own practice. I wouldn't go from one, from, from Abbey to ENS or ENS to Abbey without, a, as Boris alluded to, without a break. Uh, and I think it depends on the patient mix. I think I'm probably moving more towards using radium in people who don't have, who have bone only disease just because you worry about people progressing and not being able to, to access it if they develop visceral or significant lymph node disease. So that's probably the way that I'm going. But I think chemotherapy is important and still has a big role to play. Right. Matthew? I wholeheartedly agree. Based on this data and other data, I think there's very limited benefit to the second AR targeted therapy. Uh, and so with few exceptions, I would typically give chemotherapy or another agent. Okay. Good. 
All right, so back to you, Simon. Um, you know, this was, I, I thought, a really fascinating uh, um, uh, presentation uh, by Noel Clark. Mm. Uh, it was first author. So this was using uh, olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, combined with Abby in patients with MCRPC. And this was a randomized phase two trial. Yeah, a really interesting study, and, and probably for me, a slightly unexpected result. So, a study of around about 170 patients, as you say, randomised to Abby plus or minus olaparib, uh, one of the PARP inhibitors, which has shown some activity in in a limited group of patients from uh, Jan de Bono's TOPARP study, which showed activity in people with primarily with DNA damage repair deficiency. What's interesting about this study is they they didn't select on that alone; they they, they gave it to all comers, and there was a significant benefit across all comers, sort of RPFS of so 13 versus eight months. And when they broke it, one of the, one of the limitations of the study, and, it's, and it shows how the field has moved, this was a 2014 to 2015 study, uh, was they didn't have the genomic signature on all of these patients. They only had it on, I think, about 20, 25 patients. So, um, and they were actually matched between the two arms. But when you, when you looked at the, the whole group, the group with the genomic abnormalities, uh, the, the, the group that were known to be wild type and the unknown, that benefit was across all, all four of those groups, which is, which is interesting. And that's now going to be taken into a phase three study, and I think that's, that's the way forward, hopefully with more sort of genomic data to come from it. But very interesting if, if the preclinical work that sort of shows receptor cooperation yeah. between AR and some of the DNA repair pathways actually leads to a broadening of activity, and I suppose that's what we, we all want to see with, with, with Abby. Yeah, sort of unexpected, yeah, especially in, in the groups that don't have the, the DNA repair mechanism yeah. defects. And, but uh, what about the toxicity of the combined therapy? Yeah, I mean, there was, there was more toxicity. There was sort of 30% versus 10% uh, serious adverse events and possibly, uh, and some of those were cardiovascular. I think some of that may be length of exposure. Uh, and I know in the phase three, they're, gonna, they're gonna, going to mandate more cardiac monitoring and I think probably some of the cardiac inclusion exclusion criteria. So I think, again, not to be... I think the anemia and things like that is not surprising with a PARP inhibitor, but clearly going into the phase three, they're going to have to take a lot of attention with the, with the cardiac side of things. Yeah, I, I've certainly okay. seen that in the, the trials that I've been doing with the PARPs. Uh, there, it clearly is a myelosuppressive mm -hmm. effect, and Absolutely. having used multiple different PARPs, it seems to be a, a clearly a class effect. Um, Matthew, let me ask you about a, a really interesting trial that was um, uh, led by Cora Sternberg and it goes back to this notion around sequencing, but also are we doing the best, um, do we have the best regimen and do for adverse events and toxicity in, in, in the context of outcome? So you want to comment about her trial looking at radium, different dosing schedules? Sure. So uh, based on the Alsimka data, uh, radium-223 was approved, uh, and it was approved for up to six cycles of therapy at a, at a fixed dose. Um, and so this randomized phase two study compared that standard dose and schedule to two different regimens, either six, up to six doses at a higher um, dosing uh, regimen or standard dose, but up to 12 cycles of treatment or 12 months of treatment. Uh, and it's an important observation in that there was no apparent clinical benefit to either increasing the dose or extending the schedule um, with very similar event-free survival and overall survival between the groups. But there was greater toxicity for both of the investigational arms. So this pretty clearly you know, provides evidence that the drug should not be given at a higher dose or at a more extended schedule in any routine manner. Yeah. Oliver Sartor had done a prior trial, small numbers, but basically demonstrating an interrupted uh, a use of, um, not interrupted, but six cycles, the full course, the approved course, uh, then patients uh, going on to other therapy, I think it was majority was taxane-based, and then coming back and getting another course of radium uh, with a, a little bit more, but not much more in the way of toxicity. So I think that's an interesting to, to put that into the context of that trial. No, I think you're exactly right. So that, that was a, sort of addressing a different question. Yep. And, and in the, the, the experience that you described from Oliver Sutter, there's a sort of a survivor bias, right? So there was selecting patients who had done particularly well with their previous treatment and then retreating them. So yeah. the, the, the uh, abstract by Cora Sternberg didn't, couldn't formally address that issue. Yeah. So I don't think that approach is ruled out, but should be used with great caution based yeah. on the evidence we yeah. now have. Sure. Uh, and and it was sticking with the, the, the theme of radiopharmaceuticals and um, you know, novel new therapies, Boris, can you uh, talk about the Australian study, this, um, this phase two study with uh, uh, lutetium and, and, and PSMA gallium? 
Yeah, so this study is one of the highlights from my perspective uh, of the poster session because it uh, provides us with uh, more solid data, so an official phase two study where lutetium-177 um, PSMA radioligands were tested in a phase two setting. There has been a publication in Lancet Oncology with three, 30 patients. Now they report 50 patients. Those patients have been heavily pretreated, and we see remarkable PSA responses uh, in more than half of the patients, PSR, PSA reductions of more than 50%. And uh, I'm yeah, very happy to see that because of that. Uh, I, I think the better imaging story uh, is transforming the field because we learn, similar to the genomics, we learn just to characterize our patients better. And if we can transform that knowledge to therapy, that's uh, wonderful. And um, with the uh, radioligand therapy, um, we up till to the Australian study, we just had um, yeah, studies from Germany where we observed patients because there were some regulatory issues. Uh, and now we have a formal phase two study and there are phase three studies coming on. And for the next years, I'm looking forward to, uh, that we learn how to define the space where we best use uh, the PSMA radioligand therapy because there it provides ample opportunities of combinations and then looking at uh, DNA de repair defects, whether we might uh, have predominantly responses in those patients with the radioligand therapy. So I think it's exciting because it's a new therapy. And uh, finally, we have solid clinical data that really show a good response in these pretreated men. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, here we are, you know, for the longest period of time, we've been, we've been feasting on the androgen, androgen receptor pathway, rightfully so. But now we, we talked about a new targeted therapies in radiopharmaceuticals, diagnostic, but now theragnostic, uh, and then other novel uh, targets, uh, like PARP inhibitors, uh, we didn't really get a chance to touch too much on the, the checkpoint inhibitors, but there's so much going on right now, and there's so much of that here at ASCO. But before we close, let me just, uh, and any uh, closing comments for the gentleman? Maybe start with you, Simon. Um, I think good ASCO, nothing, nothing sort of earth shattering, but some things that added nicely to the field, particularly in the, as we move towards sort of more precision, personalized medicine. And uh, I think the abstracts that we've highlighted sort of hopefully bring that through. I agree. I think it's an exciting time in the field. There's continued additional evidence about the role of precision oncology in prostate cancer, which is relatively new to our field. And so we look forward to more of the same. Yeah, Lauren? Yeah, I certainly agree with both uh, Simon and Matthew. Um, it is excellent that we are now learning more about the, the basis of the disease and the characters of our patients more so that we can individualize treatment more. And I think that's a benefit for future clinical trials because we can define subgroups where we, using maybe earlier endpoints, have earlier results to um, even take better care of our patients in the short term. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I know you're really in demand, and, and thank you for your leadership in, in, in advanced prostate cancer care. Thank you for the research that you're doing. Um, it's been great to have a, a wonderful panel of experts here, and thanks for listening to uh, eCancer TV, and uh, all the best to everyone.